Welcome everyone as we dive into Philippians chapter 3, the second half today here at St. Matthew's Church in Glendale, California. Two weeks ago we saw, uh, read the first part of chapter 3. We took last week off and now we're going to dive into the rest of chapter 3. But we're going to start by reviewing chapter 3 verses 1 through 11, which I'll read right now where Paul is kind of talking about some of what he's encountering, some of the those who are attacking his ministry and still kind of setting the tone of his faithfulness. Chapter 3 of Philippians. Finally, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is not irksome to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evil workers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the true circumcision who worship God in spirit and glory in Christ Jesus, and put no confidence in flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if any other man thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For Jesus' sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as trash, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in Christ not having a righteousness of my own based on law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that if possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. So Paul talks about all of his credentials of, of how faithful he was, and he was even born into the upper, upper crust of religious life for his people. And he says, none of that matters. What matters is faith in Jesus Christ and the power of the cross, what Jesus has done for me. And so that's kind of where we pick up now as we go to Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. Carol, you want to start us off there, please? Okay, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which I also apprehended of Christ Jesus. So not that I've already gotten all this, not that I've already obtained all this. He's talking about all those previous experiences and how that plays into his salvation. He is still work he's still on that road i have not obtained all of this i have all nor not that i have already obtained all of this or have already been made perfect he's saying i still am not perfect as luther would say i'm still saint and sinner simultaneously paul is saying paul is talking about how much progress he has made in his faith how he has come to understand jesus as his messiah and how he has tried to follow jesus but he still sees the goal as before him. The goal is not behind him. And so he's pressing on. He's not discouraged. He's encouraged. And so he's keeping up this chase. He continues to go forward so that he can try to lay hold of this which is ahead of him. That for which Christ Jesus already took hold of him. Jesus has already called him into the faith. And now he's striving, leaning forward in that faith. Mike, verse 13, please. I can assure you, my brothers, I am far from thinking that I have already won. All I can say is that I forget the past and I strain ahead for what is still to come. It's not yet. It's the now but not yet we talk about in theology. We have been saved now but not yet. Christ has saved us now but not yet. The end has come now but not yet. I still have not fully taken hold of it, or what other translations do you have for that? Might be grasped completely. I haven't yet grasped completely. I haven't yet apprehended everything. I don't 
fully have everything. I'm still on this side of glory. But one thing I know, I'm going to do what? Put that which is behind me, behind me, and strain towards that which is ahead. He's putting the past behind him. He admitted that he was zealous, a zealous persecutor of the church. For some people, that was a credential. For him, he sees it as a fault now. He's putting all of that behind him so he can stretch forward. And the word for stretching forward there is for a runner. Picture the end of a race. Picture the tape pulled across. And what does the runner do? You kind of lean forward with your chest to be the first one across the line. That's the word he's using here. I'm leaving the past behind me so I can lean forward into what Christ has done for me. And that gets picked up in 14 Dalton, please. I press toward the finish line to win the heavenly prize to which God has called me in Christ Jesus. I'm moving on towards the goal. I'm leaning forward towards the goal to Jesus. He's continually running towards this goal for that which has called me heavenward. He's trying to win the prize. And the prize there is a word for a prize which is awarded from the, empire, from the umpire. Uh, we might think of it as a trophy in, in that day and age. If you think of what you may have heard about the ancient Olympics, what was the thing that was given to the victor? Laurel wreath, right. This is, I'm leaning on to the, per, I'm leaning towards the person who is going to put that laurel wreath on my head. We can envision it as the crown of glory, leaning forward for this, towards this mark, leaning forward, which is the heavenward or the high calling in Jesus. He's got that sight in his mind and he was, isn't going to take his eyes off that sight to look at the past. He's focusing on everything that Christ is doing for him and running the race which is before him. Now think about when Paul is writing this. He's in prison. He's probably going to be imminently facing his death. And he's saying, I'm keeping my eyes focused here. What a powerful message for our own lives and our mortality when we come near to the end to keep that prize in mind, to not be living in regrets, to not be living in the past, but to focus on Christ who is there waiting for us to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter in the joy of the Lord. That's what letting go of the past and moving forward into Christ is. Jean, how about 15, please? <clears throat> Let those of us, then, who are mature be of the same mind. And if you think differently about anything, this too God will reveal to you. So let us try to be of one mind, more mature. And if, if you're still otherwise minded, God is going to reveal more and more his grace, his mercy, his truth to you so that we as the church can come together to be of one mind. We have not obtained that, and we're not going to obtain that this side of glory. And any of you who have been in a church or in any group of people talking theology for amount, any amount of time are going to realize people don't agree all the time on everything. And that's the reality. But we're moving toward that full unity in Christ who's going to make us fully one in his heavenly kingdom. Let's go up to Clara for verse 16, please. Nevertheless, where to we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. So we're going to try and walk in this same path that Christ has set for us. This is all runner terminology. Think of the track with the runner on it. We're going to keep running towards that goal, keep running in that line, keep running, not achieving perfection on this side, but continually moving forward. This is Paul writing to the Corinthians. This is 1 Corinthians. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize. Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating my fists in the air. No, I beat my body and I make it a slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified from the prize. 
This is again, like Philippians, he's using this language of training, of running, focusing on the prize. And he does it in a slightly different way. He says this in 2 Corinthians. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all surpassing power is from God and not for, from us. We are hard pressed on every side, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but never in despair. With all of these things coming in, we kind of talked about that earlier for those of you who were on all of the things going on in the world, all of the things around us, which can be negative all the time. And even in our past, those things aren't going to have the final word because we're going to keep straining and running forward in Christ. Was somebody saying something earlier? Sorry, thought I heard somebody. I thought I kind of cut them off there. We haven't had the best connection today, so if anybody's having troubles, it's been a little choppy at times. Oh, Pastor Keith, uh -huh. can you please clarify where we are in the Bible? Uh, the star leaves are on, and they're not on our... We're in... Hi, Carol and Dave. Uh, we're in Philippians chapter 3, and we're just about to verse 17. Philippians chapter 3, verse 17... Carolyn, would you read 17, please? Brethren, join me in imitating me and mark those who live as you have an example in us. Be imitators together with me. This is actually a term which comes from Plato. It means almost compete with one another to imitate me. Not that Paul is saying that he's the Savior, but he's going to give a little bit more clarification on that and mark or take note of those who live according to the pattern that we gave you who follow the impression uh the word is the impression made by by a stroke so think of taking a hammer against metal or even a hard uh hard-nosed pen know how it leaves a mark on the paper so you can pull off that top page and yet you can see the letters underneath You've probably seen that in spy movies or something where they're trying to decipher it from reading the page underneath. It's that kind of word there. See that, that mimicked image, that imitated image, which is the pattern that we gave you. Look for that pattern. The way we live influences other people, whether we want to or not. And so what Paul is saying is he's hoping that his life is something that can be imitated by others for the good and that others by imitating paul's life and paul is really imitating jesus life that it will kind of expand and others will show this way of what christ has done in all reality while paul is saying this and hoping that others can say this our goal would be that any follower of jesus could say to others follow me now we all know our weaknesses and our warts and all of our failures, but we keep striving. We keep pre pressing towards the goal, hoping that others can see Christ in us. Again, back to 1 Corinthians, Paul says, follow my example as I follow the examples of Christ. In Thessalonians, he fleshes it out a little bit more. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. The point of imitating how Think of this as the early church, and, and people don't have a Bible. They don't have many examples. Paul is saying, he, I, I'm trying to live as an example to you so that you can be examples to others. But the example is really that we're trying to follow Christ. And even in the midst of severe suffering, Paul says, you will be welcomed with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Tracy, you want to read 18, please? Sure. For there are many of whom I have often told you and now tell you, even with tears, who walk as enemies of the cross of Christ, the anointed. So again, those of you who were with us at the beginning, as we reread verses 1 through 11, he was kind of alluding back to his problems with the Judaizers. These are these members largely of the Pharisee group from uh, the time who had come to believe in Jesus as the Messiah. They were Christians, but they couldn't let go of their legalism and they tried, they tried to impose their legalism on others. Now he may be talking about that, but we'll see it fleshed out a little bit more. As I've told you before, now even with tears, there are those who are living as enemies of the cross. 
I'm telling you this even with weeping. You can tell the deep emotion that he's writing with. There are those who are enemies of the cross. Now, he's just been talking about the Judaizers, so maybe he's referring to that again. But he's also probably bringing up another group, which we will see in verse 19. Karen, please. Karen, are you... Oh, okay. I didn't hear you call my name. Sorry, Karen, 19, please. All right. I warn you again that they are headed for hell. They worship their stomachs and brag about the disgusting things they do. All they can think about are the things of this world. Oh, well, that was real tough. What translation was that? Um, contemporary English version. Contemporary English. Oh, interesting. Uh, yeah, that was real tough. Okay. Uh, <laughs> their destiny is, what other words do you have than hell? Destruction. 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 Uh, be lost. Lost. Those are probably better words. I'm not sure that he's saying hell here. He's, but he, I mean, I suppose there's that implication. Basically, so their end is destruction. They're destroying themselves because what's their real God? Their belly. belly. Their belly. Right. Their belly is their real God. Seneca, the Roman uh, orator Seneca, had spoken of the abdomini servit. Abdomini servit. Though I see Mike nodding, translate the Latin for us. Ad, ad, uh, abdomen, <laughs> their gut. Those who serve their gut, those who serve their stomach, that their stomach is the total focus of their lives. He may be talking about a group that exists at that time we call the Epicureans. There were other groups that everything was about kind of hedonism. Everything was about their own pleasure. Everything was about filling their own belly. And what he's saying is there are also those around us who are enemies of the cross because all they're thinking about is feeding themselves. In Euripides, he talks about the Cyclops. Remember Cyclops, that ugly, one-eyed image? This is a line from the Cyclops in one of the stories. My flocks, which I sacrifice to no one but myself, and not to the gods, and to this my belly, which is the greatest of the gods, for to eat and drink each day, and to give one's self no trouble, this is the true god for wise men. There was this strain of thought, which ran counter to most of Roman culture and thought at the time, of total hedonism, total focus on self, and Paul is saying that type of totally focusing on fulfilling all of your sensual desires is going to lead to shame because their mind is on earthly things. Mark those whose minds are only on earthly things because they bring about their own destruction. And the word for destruction there is kind of a loss of well-being, a waste, a ruin, to end up with a worthless existence. People who are totally focused only on those sensual things, only about those daily things about having lots of food and lots of drink, when that becomes the focus, when that becomes the God, the life ends up being completely worthless. Paul to the Romans says, for such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. And Jesus had said something similar when Jesus said, Watch out, be on guard against all kinds of greed, because a person's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Kind of the exact opposite of much of what we see in our culture today. Everything is about more, more, more. And when we think we have enough, then there's a commercial which comes along and says, no, you need more, more, more. And if you're not accumulating more, 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 somehow you are less successful than others. Absolutely the opposite of what Christ is teaching, which is to give for others, to take care of others, to set the example for others, Paul's talking about here, and not focusing solely on your own self and your own desires. Because, Judy H. 20, please. But our commonwealth is in heaven, 
And from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our commonwealth, or other translations? Citizenship. Our citizenship. Homeland. What? Our homeland. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, cool. Okay. Conversation. Our conversation? Yes, in the King James. Oh, interesting. Our conversation is in heaven. Huh. It's got to have a different meaning of how ah. than how we use it today. I don't, I don't follow that one at all. I'm sure it must, uh, conversation must have been used differently back then. I got to yeah. look that up. That's interesting. Well, now remember, what do we know about Paul and citizenship? Roman. Roman. Paul had his Roman citizenship, which was quite uncommon. We think of you live in a country, you're probably a citizen of the country. Not true of the Roman Empire. The vast majority of people did not hold citizenship. They were subjects. They were not citizens. Paul, uniquely, like a few people, happens to hold citizenship. And he's in Philippi. Can you remember back weeks ago to what I told you about Philippi? Who lived in Philippi? Who founded Philippi? Octavius. Okay, you're remembering back to the battle. Who tended to live in Philippi? Philippians. <laughs> <Yeah. Good. Perfect. laughs> Many of them. That's what I live with. Roman, Roman citizens. There, there, are, Roman there are a good number of probably former Roman soldiers, people of Roman society. And because of the things that had happened in, in Philippi, and uh, Mike was alluding to the final battle there. Uh, because of all that, Philippi was given Roman status. So it was a city in Greece, not far from Turkey, but this city was considered an imperial city so that these people had citizenship. Again, that was very odd, very unique. So everything, if you remember those first three chapters of Philippi, the first two chapters of Philippians, he was talking about how it's important to live up to being this citizen of God's kingdom. It's important to be part of this body together, not running off, focusing on our own individual needs. Now he kind of goes back to that theme and says, our true citizenship is where? In heaven. The people he's writing to consider their Roman citizenship incredibly important. They are undoubtedly incredibly proud of being citizens of Philippi. Citizens of Rome who live in Philippi, this is kind of like, I don't know, uh, these are the people from D.C. who are in the know. You know, these are the K Streeters in D.C. These are the people who have it all. They're on that higher plane. And he says, you know what? That's not what's important because your true citizenship is in heaven. And if your true citizenship is in heaven, verse 21, Pam, please who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. We're awaiting a savior who is going to take these lowly bodies and transform them to be like his glorious body. Why would you waste your time focusing on the God of the belly, on all of these other pursuits, on accumulation and, and, um, incredible overindulgence, why would you focus on that when your lowly body is going to be transformed in the next kingdom? Those who are in Jesus will have a new body, which is going to be so much superior to this, that why would you even care what it looks like now as far as that trial of accumulation? In great mercy, Peter says, he's given us a new birth into the living hope so that we can receive an inheritance that will never perish, spoil, or fade, an inheritance which is kept in heaven for you. End of chapter three. About two minutes for questions. I talked a lot. We covered a lot of ground, so... Um, about chapter nine or uh, verse nineteen, mm -hmm. and, and talking about the bellies, um, 
it's like feeding one's self, like as you were mentioning, and that will, that's what was coming to me, that constant feeding of ourselves to the neglect of our neighbor and neglect of family and neglect of, and, um, you know, I can, I can see that. I mean, even in the, in the bombardment of, in the, of this quote information age, you know, there's, it's all about us and, and, um, keeping ourselves separate and fed, but not really, it, it doesn't really talk about the neighbor or those kinds of things. And yet we've got pain and suffering all over the world. There is no perfect economic system in the world. Every economic system, socialism, communism, capitalism, are all designed by flawed human minds, which are sinful. That said, I think you could make an argument that capitalism has done the most to raise people up, but we should never deny that it's still based in sin like every other system. And one of the negative aspects of capitalism is its consumerism. To keep the system going, there has to be more and more purchasing all the time, more and more consumption of things, and that tends to lead to a focus, what you just said. Everyone has its own weaknesses. Still think this is probably the best that we have in sinful human society but always remember those sinful aspects so that you can focus on the greater good. Good. Okay, let's close with prayer. God has called us from every nation and culture to become one family. With one voice we pray that the family of the church in every nation may grow each day in love for Jesus and for one another. God, hear us. God, receive our prayer. We pray that all who strive for justice and peace may have the courage to persevere in their efforts. God, hear us. God, receive our prayer. We pray that those who are unemployed and fearful for their future may be supported by those around them. God, hear us. God, receive our prayer. We pray that our community may be saved from complacency and find support in each other. God, hear us. God, receive our prayer. We pray that renewed health may be given to our relatives, friends, and members, and those in our gathering this day who are struggling. God, hear us. God, receive our prayer. Hear these prayers, all loving God, and give us the strength to persevere in faithfulness. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Thank you for all joining us and new faces. Dave and Carol, good to see you again. Uh, council members do not leave. Council meeting starts here any moment now, but the rest of you have a moment to say ciao. Ciao. <laughs> <laughs> and here is Scott and Gladys. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. So it's the oh, August fourth, um, August fourth okay. column. Okay. Hey, okay. Scott, hey, Scott, amazing. Gladys. Amazing, Scott. What a it's story. Autograph. Oh. <laughs> if you send me your email, I, I scanned it. I could send it to you. Oh, I want it. Oh, but the oh, online yeah. thing. The on the online thing. Is better if you can get the original article online. Perfect. I'll send it to you. More, Perfect. More pictures. Thank you. Yeah, I want more pictures. <laughs> okay. More stories. Yeah. Amazing. Well, story. well, it, well it, it is tied to St. Matthew's Church. Yes. Yeah. All right. Great. Carolyn, I'll come back to Bible study. Yeah, bye. Okay, bye. Bye, everybody. Bye, bye. 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 Bye, bye.